I really appreciate that you're listening and that this platform has been offered for us to speak. Uh, my name is Shia Bastida. I am 17 years old. I am half Mexican, half Chilean. I am from the indigenous group um, Otomi Toltec peoples from the highlands of Mexico. So I just want to say a couple of things. Um, first, I'm gonna fill you in on how I got here all of a sudden. So it was, today's Monday, it was maybe Saturday night that I got a message on one of the social media apps from Earth Day Network and it said, Hi Shie, we are having a panel on, on Monday. We need you to be in DC. And then I asked, what time is it? Because I was planning on coming to DC on, on Tuesday night to, because on Wednesday, 21 plaintiffs are addressing the Supreme Court on the Juliana versus government lawsuit, uh, which is basically to, you know, um, youth suing the government because we want a stable climate. So, they told me, you need to be there at 8.30 a.m. and the panel starts at 9. And so I told my mom and Alexandria needed to come as well. So we just all got in a bus and came together to DC out of nowhere. And then this came up and I was, I was you know, it was just fits per perfectly to my schedule. My previous thing ended at 12 and my next thing starts at around 6. So this is like the perfect timing in between. And you know, from what my dad has taught me, everything happens for a reason. And right now we are in times of crisis, but there's opportunity in, crisis, in times of crisis. We need to take that opportunity to come together. And we need to take the opportunity of going from competition to collaboration. Because we have taught, um, by the, we have been taught by the system to be individualistic and to say, I want to make um, something of myself. I want to, you know, be successful. And that is a good thing to think, but we need to think in community when it comes to that. We need to think, um, be, um, not only in community with each other as humans, but also in community with the earth as a whole system that is working together. And right now it's very weird for me that taking care of the earth and just being an environmentalist is part of a movement. Because when did it become a movement to take care of each other and to take care of our history and to take care of our traditions and to take care of our future? That should be part of our culture. It shouldn't be something that we're fighting for. It shouldn't be something that is unnatural to us. And right now, it is a tipping point. The youth have realized that this is gonna affect our generation the most if we don't do something within the next 10 years. And that comes from the IPCC report that said that we have 12 years to have our carbon emissions to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming. And those 12 years are five, uh, are 10 years and four months now. The clock keeps ticking and we need to catch up. So just another thing that I wanted to bring to attention is that my generation is called Gen Z. And we didn't choose that name, you chose it for us. And Gen Z is the last letter of the alphabet it symbolizes the end of something. And my question is, does that mean that you want us to be the last generation? I don't think it does. So we are reframing that and saying, we are gonna be the last generation who is dependent on fossil fuels. That is it. We are gonna be the last generation to be caught up in this system of selfishness, of human selfishness, because we need to be selfless in order to be part of the larger body of life. And you know, I've encountered a lot, a lot of climate deniers in my journey as an activist, and what they usually tell me is that 
the earth just warms in cycles and that it's warm now and it's gonna go cold again and it's gonna warm up again and so then I say let's say our you know the Amazon is not burning let's say our glaciers are not melting let's say hurricanes are not being you know made worse because of warmer water but what about all of our air pollution and our water pollution and our plastic pollution wouldn't you all benefit from a world that is clean because we have renewable energies and because we have no single-use plastics and because we don't have pipelines contaminating water. When indigenous people protect land so that pipelines don't go through, they don't do it for themselves, they do it for you because you don't want dirty water. You don't want water that is flammable. And that is what's happening in many parts of the world, including Flint right here in the US. So, we need to shift from that and not only think about actual, our actual planet getting hotter, but how we're only also contaminating that planet and how that is contaminating ourselves. We need to clean ourselves, clean the planet and have clean ideas that are clean from the beginning to the end. And so I don't know what's after this, but thank you for listening. Yeah, I think your dad um, was using a term which was beautiful at the UN called clean thoughts, right? Does that sound like him? Yeah. yeah, clean ideas, yeah. And so, you know, from the indigenous um, wisdom, you know, I love how you talk about how this is like so stupid that we're talking about, you know, climate change, you know, and it's like, indigenous, for, take that another step, indigenous wisdom, it's like, you know, this delusion, this temporary delusion as we spin around on this ball at 1,040 miles an hour, pretending like we're somehow not connected and separate from each other. You know, it, it, you don't even have to come to the point, right, of like, let's your point of not wanting to believe in climate, you know, change or anything like that. It's like, you know, when you hurt someone or something else, you hurt yourself because we are all one, right? And, and we're being reminded of that because we've come to a tipping point where it's just, just unsustainable. I mean, look, look, just take a breath and look what we're doing to ourselves as species. It's insane. So one of the things I want to chat with you about, let's just ch talk back and forth and then if there's any questions. Um, you know, we need to learn from you guys, right? And I know you get that question a lot. So maybe just let's talk about what, so first of all, my personal commitment is that I will be Rainbow Bridge and however I can serve for you guys. And you know, when you look at the magic of where we are here, I mean, we're at the World Bank and we're with the World Academy of Arts and Sciences, which I won't give justice to. We can maybe talk later about um, the venerable organization that that is. But it really is like the perfect place to have this conversation. We couldn't have planned it any better, right? About how this, how this bridge is over. So what are the things that, you know, we, you know, as we sit here and we talk about future capital, you know, how we move trillions of dollars of this capital, this thing that we've invented called capital, which is um, a very powerful tool and when used unconsciously, gets us where we are, right? So when we sit here and we've got some of the best minds in the world in this room right now, strategizing this, what are the, some of the things we gotta remember? Some of the things we gotta, right, that we wouldn't be thinking of because our minds are, plus or not, it's clear. That's yours. So for that, I want to ask you a question. Why do we measure countries and ourselves with GDP, right? So like that's one of the most basic questions. And whenever you look up a country on the internet, the first thing that comes up is GDP. And you know, I know the US has one of the highest GDPs, but it's not representative of our population at all. So the first question is, why are our standards of living based on something that is not representative of our people? And I know that it's, you know, it's so obvious for you, or maybe it's, it has become a habit for you to use that, and it's almost unimaginable, unimaginable, <laughs> unimaginable to change it. But Bhutan is an example that I love. They use gross domestic happiness, and they're not rich but they're happy and they're actually carbon negative. 
because they absorb more carbon than what the country produces. So it, it has to come from judging the foundation of the system. Why are we using these standards of, of you know, counting stuff for looking at our standards of living? Yeah, basically. And something that is not um, taking it into consideration most of the time is that, for example, if you use solar panels, you know, solar panels is a renewable, renewable energy, but if the solar panels are not made in a mindful way from the start, are they really helping? And I think that's a very good example of how we can have good ideas, but not a good process. And we can have mindful ideas, but not a mindful process. So we need to make sure that our goals are mindful, that our process is mindful, and that our intentions are genuine. And, you know, we as children, we don't have the time to grow up and be what we wanted to be anymore. I wanted to study biochemistry and I wanted to do all these amazing things and research. But we are at times where our most powerful um, position comes from being messengers of the existing science. That is where we can serve the most. And you tell us that, not you, but maybe you, tell us that we have to go to school. Um, and yes, we do, because it's our civic duty. We go to school so that we can grow up and be good members of society. And we are disrupting that during our, our school strikes because you're asking us to go to school when you're not listening to the educated scientists who are telling you we have 10 years left. And you're telling us to go to school for a future that we might not be able to have. If I study to be a teacher or a biochemist, can you ensure me that I will have a job in 20 years? I don't know if you can. And I want you to be able to ensure that for us. And I want to ensure that for my children. So it's about shifting our whole way of thinking and it's hard. And we need you as well. We as kids cannot vote. Most of us are under 18. But we are telling you we need you because you can voice that power and you can use the government for what it's supposed to do which is ensuring a healthy existence <laughs> and so i just want to say that in order for this to move forward us children have to listen to adults because you have the knowledge and you have the experience of having lived through these times but you have to listen to us because it's our moral authority. We are going to grow up to times that are unpredictable and we want to be able to be safe and we want to be able to be healthy. And so it's very important for us to, you know, not only hold the hand of someone older, but also hold the hand of someone younger and realize the importance of that connection and realize the importance of that fluidity of knowledge that needs to happen.